yes we are live okay fine hello students uh, so today's session is going to be on uh, maternal pelvis and uh, the fetal skull and we will discuss what kind of questions will be asked in viva voice when you go for this particular station okay so first let us deal with the fetal skull so uh, i i do have a presentation i think we'll look at it later or uh, what do we do i i'll give an introduction first and uh, then like yeah after after i started making content okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on mechanism of labor demonstration. Uh, for the session today, I welcome Dr. Professor Dr. Veena Ma'am, Department of OBG from Jipma Pondicherry. Uh, welcome, you, Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, we can start the session. Yeah, fine. So, as I told, uh, we will be uh, learning about uh, fetal skull and maternal pelvis, and what kind of questions they are going to ask you uh, when you go to this particular station in my. course of your exam so first we'll uh, see what is fetal skull okay so for that uh, um, i'll i'll be sharing my screen now let's go to, go through the presentation and then um, few slides about fetal skull what exactly is can are you able to see my sli uh, slides yes ma'am okay so uh, about the fetal skull this is how the fetal skull is okay so uh, the different parts of the fetal skull is what is the, the commonly asked question is this identify the suture lines identify the fontanelles different bones okay so basically um, i think i'll finish this presentation in and in a while and then i'll show you on the fetal skull okay so this is the different parts the frontal bone the parietal bone the coronal sutures here okay the sagittal suture here when we hold the skull upside down okay and then anterior fontanelle and posterior font fontanelle these two are very important landmarks for us during the dynamics of labor okay and then we have other uh, things like sphenoid fontan fontanelle and mastoid fontanelle and all this is not important for you what's important is you have to identify both parietal bones okay these two parietal bones and sagittal suture in between the two parietal bones and we have frontal bone and a uh, anterior fontanel anteriorly and a posterior fontanel posteriorly and an occipital bone okay so this this much if you are able to answer it's enough and one more important thing is this mentum because in face presentation generally we will see the mentum okay and then there are different diameters of the fetal skull you will have to memorize them the uh, at least these five you should know okay the suboccipital bregmatic which is the most common one which will come into play in a well flexed head okay so that will be 9.5 cm you know fully flexed vertex which is the most common way a woman will deliver then we have slight deflection where the suboccipital frontal will come into the picture okay this is the one suboccipital frontal okay suboccipital bregmatic is from the anterior fontanel to suboccipital this is suboccipital bregmatic which is 9.5 cm suboccipital frontal mild deflection is 10.5 just keep on adding 1 cm for each one of them okay so we have suboccipital bregmatic then suboccipital frontal then occipital frontal okay occipital frontal is basically from the occipital protuberance to the frontal bone okay that is 11.5 so add one more centimeter actually in exam when you are answering it's always better to answer in the range like 9.25 to 9.5 10.5 to 11 11.5 to 12 something like that put a range if possible otherwise you have to tell the exact what is given over here that's also fine then we have the most uh, the, the biggest diameter that is your mento vertical from the mentum that is the tip of mandible to the vertex the highest point on the vertex which comes into play in brow presentation and there is no mechanism of labor for this particular thing the last one is submento bregmatic which is a fully flexed head okay see this five and Uh, one both of them are almost equal okay so sub submento bregmatic is 9.5 cm that is seen in face presentation is it clear okay these are the five anterior posterior diameters depending upon the attitude of the head okay that is fully flexed head is suboccipital bregmatic 9.5 with increasing deflection we have 10.5 11.5 the worst possible diameter is mento vertical in brow it is 13.5 to 14 cm and again when the head completely extends it, it, the 9.5 only will come into force that is submento bregmatic in face presentation these are the important anterior posterior diameter so start as 9.5 see 9.5 is very important for us okay see this we, we have already two diameters here which are equal to 9.5 cm suboccipital bregmatic in vertex and submento bregmatic in face presentation okay so 
9.5 is a starting point for us for any usually used diameters. Okay. Now there is one more diameter which is 9.5 centimeter. Can you see this? That is biparietal diameter. That is between the two parietal eminences. Okay. On the parietal bones, parietal eminences in between the two of them, we have this biparietal diameter which is the maximum. See this among all the transverse diameters, this is the maximum diameter. That is the one which comes into play in most of the deliveries, 98, 99% uh, of deliveries, that is biparietal diameter. Okay. But there are other uh, transverse diameters also, the bitemporal between the two temporal bones here. Okay. Okay. And then we have bimastoid between the two mastoid processes. And we have super subparietal or supra subparietal where, see, the, we spoke about this. The previous slide, you remember the flexion and extension? This is basically flexion and extension like this. This moment is what we spoke about. But here, the next slide, the transverse diameter will vary depending on the lateral flexion of the head. Can you see this? Okay. So, in, the, in case of lateral flexion, when the baby's head turns like this, in yourself, you can try and see. See, this is a bipartial diameter. When the baby's head turns, automatically one of your finger will go above the parietal eminence and one will come below the parietal eminence. Okay, that is called as supra subparietal diameter, which is 8.25 to 9 centimeters. So we'll gain few millimeters only here, but it is very important. Okay, this is one way the head will try to negotiate the brim. Okay, in case of borderline pelvis. Okay, so that is supra subparietal. So, bipretemporal diameter is not very important for you people. It's, it, it rarely comes into picture in case of uh, flat pelvis and all. First of all, flat pelvis is extremely uncommon. So, forget about that. The bimastoid diameter, sometimes they can ask you in viva, what is the significance of bimastoid diameter? You can see here, bimastoid is exactly in the base of the skull where we have this uh, very rigid bones. Okay, So, it is not possible to destroy this particular diameter. You, you people are aware of some... Um, what do you call those? Destructive surgeries in case of intrauterine fetal demise, a term. Okay, CPD is there. There is a dead baby inside. You don't want, you don't feel like doing cesarean section. Okay, so there what we do is we do some procedures to decrease the, uh, the presenting diameter of the fetal skull called as craniotomy or something like that, where we remove the intracranial contents. Okay, which will make the skull bone collapse and the diameter will come down. Okay, they are the destructive surgeries. So, this is one diameter which you cannot reduce at all by whichever destructive surgery you do. Okay. So, if your available pelvic diameter is less than 8 centimeters, then there is no point doing any destructive procedure because your bimastoid is only 7.5 centimeters. Okay. So, that is why this diameter is the only obstetric significance of bimastoid diameter. Okay. This is an irreducible uh, diameter by any kind of destructive surgery. So, if the pelvic diameter which is available is less than this, then we can't do anything about the uh, delivery will have to do a cesarean section only. Okay. That's about the transverse diameters. Is it clear? So we have biparietal diameter, then we have bitemporal, which is which comes into action only in flat pelvis, platypelloid pelvis. Then we have bimastoid, the irreducible diameter. And in case of asynclitism, that is lateral flexion of the skull, we have this supra subparietal diameter. Okay, so hardly any difference between them. The largest one is biparietal, that is 9.5 centimeters. Then we have the supra subparietal, which comes into action in asynclitism, it is 8.25 to 9 centimeters. So we'll be hardly gaining the half to three fourth of a centimeter when the head turns like this. It's not a big difference, but it really makes a difference when we have borderline pelvis. Okay, so now one more important thing about the fetal skull is we have this. Uh, why why is this deflection such a big problem? Okay, other even though there is no gross disproportion between a, a deflexing head and the pelvis, what exactly happens is see when you have a well flexed head, what is the anteroposterior diameter? Kunj or Priya, anybody? In a well flexed head, what is presenting? Anteroposterior diameter of the skull. Occipital bracketry. Sub not sub Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. it is breaking. Yes, ma'am. But the voice but is breaking. I'll check if my internet is. Uh, Kunj? Yes, ma'am. Okay, shall I go on? Priya? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think your screen is stuck. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. Is it okay now? Is it full screen now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. Fine. So let's uh, start again. So I was telling you that the anterior posterior diameter in a fully flexed head is sub sub occipital bregmatic, which is nine point five centimeters. What's the transverse diameter? Biparietal. Biparietal. How much is that? Nine point five centimeters. Nine point five. So you have a surface which is going to present to the cervical rim, okay, which is almost a circle. Right, nine point five and nine point five, anterior posterior. Okay, a well flexed head, a vertex. This is the vertex for how we show actually. Can you see this? It's supposed to show like this from posterior fontanel to anterior fontanel and both the parietal eminences. This this area is called as vertex. Yes. Okay, so this is almost a circle because their anterior posterior diameter and the lateral diameter is same. Okay, how is the cervical ring when the labor starts? When the presenting part has to press on the cervix. Cervical ring is a circle. Okay, so if you have a circular object pressing down like this, then it will give equal pressure on all the points of the circumference of cervix. Okay, and by reflex it will dilate well. So a fully flexed vertex is a good dilator of cervix. Is it clear? Okay, that's a very important concept you should remember when we talk about dummy pelvis. Okay, and now we have a deflexed head. Now let's take occipital frontal. How much is occipital frontal? Ten point five centimeters. Ten point five was suboccipital frontal. Occipital frontal is eleven point five. ठीक है and your biparietal is nine point five. So what kind of structures we have? A oval, complete oval. Okay, a oval surface won't press on a circular ring of cervix that effectively when compared to a circular surface. Okay, so it is not a good dilator of cervix. In which position is deflection more common? You know what is the position of a, a fetal head? Left of fetal transverse. Of the denominator. See, there are a lot of definitions which come into play when you take dummy pelvis. Okay, right from your uh, lie of the fetus, transverse lie, oblique lie, and you know longitudinal lie. That's the lie of the fetus. Then we have presentation. Even in a longitudinal lie, we can have cephalic and breech presentation. Okay, depending on which pole the head is occupying. Okay, and then in cephalic again, we'll have different. You know, it can be vertex in you know, a fully flexed head, or face in case of fully extended head, or brow in it, it, if it is partially extended head. Okay, like that. It, so many things keep on coming. The presenting part is something which overlies the cervix. Okay, whichever is just pressing on the cervix is presenting part. In the presenting part, every pre presentation will have a denominator. Okay, denominator in vertex is occiput. Occiput. Okay, in face is mentum. Okay, like that, everything will have a presenting part or a denominator. So the relationship of the denominator with the different quadrants of maternal pelvis is position. Okay, left. the most common position is L O T. L O T. Okay, left, left occipital left. transverse, where the head will enter like this. This is your uh, pelvis. So left side and occipital. Can you see this? This is how the head will enter. Okay, this is the L O T where the head is transversely entering the pelvis. Okay, that's the most common because see when you if you have to go through a tunnel or something like that, which one do you prefer? You are uh, around um, your diameter is around ten centimeter or whatever, and your tunnel's diameter is ten uh, uh, is better or eleven is better or twelve is better. Which one will you prefer? The largest one. Larger. Okay. Moderate. So when we look at the pelvis, you'll understand that in the brim, the transverse is the largest diameter, that is thirteen centimeters. That is why the fetus wants to enter the pelvis as comfortably as possible. That is why the head will almost always engage in left occipital transverse. Is it clear? Okay. So we'll we'll look at those relationships later on when we talk about mechanism of labor. But right now, remember that this this particular you know the attitude of the head makes a difference in the Shape of the presenting part, and it will affect the the progress of labor also, the cervical dilatation and all this stuff. Okay, that's very important. Now tell me one thing. Now look at this uh, carefully. The last one. Okay, it is full extension of head. That is face presentation. Okay, in face presentation, what will happen? In face presentation, the diameter, transverse diameter is pi pi diameter. That is nine point five centimeter. What is the anterior posterior diameter? Submento bregmatic, which is again nine point five centimeters. Nine point five centimeters. 
So mathematically, there is obviously no difference between a vertex and a face. Even then, face is classified as malpresentation. Agree? You people have read in the ch chapters, no? Face comes under malpresentation and vertex is normal for us. Okay. So even though the diameters are almost the same and the same circle only is going to present, why is face called as a malpresentation? That's a food for thought for you guys. Think about it. Okay. If I start that chapter, it will become an entirely different discussion. But with whatever we learned till now, you know that vertex has got the best uh, progress in labor because it is a circular structure pressing on the surface. Okay. When compared to that, face also has same diameter, the same circular structure because the biparietal and the anterior portion is same in face also. But there it is classified as malpresentation. So think about um, you know why face is a malpresentation. Keeping this in mind, then we'll be able to understand. Okay, so that's about your uh, fetal skull. Now we'll let's um, uh, get out of this. Uh, how do you stop sharing? Where is my sharing? And on the top of the screen, there would be an option. To... Okay. Now, yeah, if you take yeah, the yeah. cursor to the top, yeah. there's a stop screen. Yeah, yeah, fine. I got it. Um, now, can you see uh, the screen is uh, sharing is stopped, right? So, you'll be able to see my thing completely now? Uh, not, not yet? Sharing is still why? going on. It's still going on? Uh, why there is no option of stop sharing here? There's only new share is there. That's all. I think it's stopped. Uh, Isn't it? You're able to see my uh, uh, screen even now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, I don't know. I've stopped yes, from here, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Do that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So now, now let's look at this um, fetal skull now. Okay. Can you see this? So we are supposed to identify all these things. This is the front of the skull, which is very obvious. You have two orbital fossa. You have the, uh, this particular skull, the mentum is missing. I'm sorry, wrote that. Okay. So you have the supraorbital ridges here. And then when you go up like this on the vertex, you will see the anterior fontanel here. Okay. And the posterior fontanel. So posterior fontanel is a triangular structure and the anterior fontanel is a rhomboid structure. Okay. So that you should be able to identify. The suture line which runs between the anterior and posterior fontanel is sagittal suture. suture. Okay. And then these sutures are Coronal suture. Coronal suture. Okay. Then when you go to the back of the skull like this, you will see this is the occipital yeah. bone. Okay. This is a posterior fontanel. And these are lambdoid sutures. Okay. This will be kind of a triradiate suture. So it's called a lambdoid suture. Okay. So remember these sutures and the fontanels and the bones. These are the parietal bones on both the sides. Okay. Occipital bone, the posterior most part, and the frontal bone in the front. Okay. Then we have the temporal bones in the side here. Okay, and then the uh, mandible will come here. These are the mastoid processes. Can you see the mastoid processes where I'm putting my fingers here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that is yes. the mastoid processes there. Okay, so that is about the fetal skull, how to identify things. Okay, now uh, the uh, how do you hold a fetal skull? Most of the fetal skulls will have the foramen magnum open. Okay, even if it is not open, please remember you have to fold it like this. Okay, can you see here? The index finger into the foramen magnum. Okay. And both the uh, the thumb and the middle finger on the mastoid process, hold it like this. Remember that in cephalic presentation, we are upside down. Get that orientation clear in your mind first. Okay, always never hold the skull like this. This is breech presentation. Okay, yes. so in cephalic, it's always going to be like this. Okay, and how do you show a, a well-flexed head? What happens now? It is exactly military attitude. Okay, the occiput is here. The sinciput is here. This is a military attitude skull. Okay, now if you want to show, show flexion, a well-flexed head, then occiput will go down. Okay, this is a well-flexed head. When it is well-flexed, you can see the diameter is going to be this. That is some occiput or pragmatic diameter. Okay, moment I keep on deflexing, see how my finger will move. It's very beautiful actually. Okay, first suboccipito frontal, then occiputo frontal. Okay, and then mento vertical okay go to the mentum and the highest point on the vertex that is mento vertical and then again sub mento pragmatic okay depending on the attitude of the head you'll be able to make out easily 
Is it clear? Okay. Yes, so you're supposed to hold the skull like this, and this is a well flexed head. Slight deflection. Again, pro prominent deflection. Then brow presentation. Okay, where this is the part. Okay. They can ask you an exam to show what is vertex, what is brow, what is face. How do you identify these structures? Okay. Vertex is the area which is between the anterior fontanel and posterior fontanel. Okay, and two parietal eminences in the lateral last foot. So generally, I told you already, we hold it like this. We show it like this. this is a very tiny skull. This is how we show. This is a vertex, the area which is called as vertex. Okay. Now, what is brow presentation? Brow presentation is basically the area between the anterior fontanel and supraorbital ridges. Okay, this is a brow presentation. Face presentation is from supraorbital ridges to mentum. Okay, so this is the face presentation. You should not be able to feel the anterior fontanel in face presentation. Please remember. Okay, if you are able to feel the anterior fontanel, then you will never be able to feel the mentum. Okay, mentum is the denominator in face presentation, so mentum should be palpable. Yes. Okay, so this is how the skull you will show. Okay, this is the face presentation. You can we can just again do the same thing. Fold like this and show brow presentation. Okay, between the supraorbital ridges and the anterior fontanel and vertex presentation between the anterior and posterior fontanel and laterally to parietal eminences. Okay, the denominators you should know the occiput here. This is the denominator in most common presentation that is vertex presentation. And this is a mentum here. I assume this is the lower part of the mandible. So this will be the mentum. Okay. And for brow, it is frontum, the most prominent part, the sinciput, whatever we call that is in brow, is, that is a denominator for brow presentation. Okay. So that's about the fetal skull. Any other uh, things you want to know about fetal skull? Actually, pelvis is much more extensive when compared to skull. Okay. Fetal skull, um, the commonest questions asked are the same thing. Identify the landmarks, number one. Number two, they can ask you about each diameter, how the diameter changes. I showed you in transverse diameter. I hope you understood. This is the biparietal, the one which is maximum. Okay. Bitemporal is here. Bimastoid is here. Okay. And the suprasuparietal, tilt the head and show them. One above one parietal eminence, another one below another parietal eminence. Supra subparietal diameter, that is, by, uh, uh, which comes into action in asynclerism. Okay. They are the transverse diameter. So, diameters, you are clear? No yes, doubt yes. now? Okay. So, next, what do we have? Um, uh, so some Sometime they may ask you, uh, what are the three diameters which are equal to 9.5 centimeters? I already told you. We have sub uh, occipitopragmatic, biparietal, and submentopragmatic. All the three of them are equal to 9.5 centimeters. Okay. So, that's about the diameters. Then what do we have? We next have, um, where do you do craniotomy? Okay, if the patient has got uh, hydrocephalus, what do you do? Hydrocephalus, what do we do? We do a procedure called as cephalocentesis. So we just put in a needle and aspirate the cerebrospinal fluid, right? So for that, we go through the fontanel, the membranous area, which is still, the bone is still not ossified there. It's a membranous area. So, depending on the presentation, we'll go through the fontanel. Preferably, it's anterior fontanel, which is going to be useful because it's a nice, open nicely. Okay. Or if you want to do a destructive surgery like craniotomy, where will you do the destructive surgery? Will you go through the fontanel or you have to remove all the intracranial contents? Okay. But parietal bone, maybe. Yeah, it's better to go through parietal bone. Good, good. Okay. So, because in craniotomy, you have to make a hole which won't collapse again. So that the intracranial contents can come out. If you make a hole in the membranous area, that is fontanel, it will collapse again. Okay. Bone, you will be breaking the bone. There is no way it can come and close again. It won't contract or collapse or something. So the craniotomy will be in the parietal bone. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Yes. Fine. I think that much should be enough about skull. We'll go about it again later when we're doing the mechanism of labor. Okay. Now let's move on to pelvis. I'll again share my screen. Okay. So uh, let's discuss the pelvis part now. Man, one doubt like why yeah, doing sure, the, the ventricular peritoneal shunt also we do via the parietal bone itself. Okay, I'm not really sure about all these things. Who does who does ventricular peritoneal shunt by the way? Like in hydrocephalus, it it is done. No? Hydrocephalus, I am only talking about the in utero what we do before delivery. Once it is delivered, we hand over to the neurosurgeons or feed surgeons or whatever you are here to ask them. Sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, BP shunt, uh, who will be able to tell you? Anybody is there around? I really don't know, but I'm, I'm not sure how exactly it is done. Okay. So uh, let's let's move on to the pelvis now. Shall I go ahead? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. 
This is pelvis. You can see the pelvis. Right. Okay. So again, in pelvis, the same way we discussed in the fetal skull, the different bones and different, uh, you know, boundaries, so whatever. The same way we'll discuss the maternal pelvis also. Okay. This is a little bulkier uh, thing now. So maternal pelvis, um, I think I'll finish the presentation, then show you the thing, different things. Okay, that's better. Okay. So now, basically, uh, the pelvis, maternal pelvis, when we say, it's basically, it's obtained by joining the axis. Of, uh, we have gone one slide ahead, yeah. Okay, this is a one. So from opposite point, it's useful to consider the bony pelvis as a whole rather than separately. Even though it is made up of four bones, okay? Two innominate bones, one sacrum and one coccyx, okay? But uh, we consider it as a single unit. We don't really, because the joints, whichever are there, like sacral like joints, pubic symphysis, all these things are not mobile joints, like a shoulder joint or knee joint or ankle. And they're very, very minimal movements are allowed in those particular joints. But they have an important function. During labor, again, as I told you, uh, in case of borderline disproportion, okay, the progesterone is the uh, hormone of pregnancy, which will cause significant dilatation of, uh, you know, you would say it's the kind of, uh, it will smoothen all the joints and these joints with whatever few millimeters they open up during labor. Okay, it's called as giveaway of pelvis. Okay, so these joints are not completely closed. There will be some space which will again further open during labor and they will, it will lead to better diameters for the baby and uh, borderline disproportion is taken care of. Okay, that is called as uh, giveaway of the pelvis. The reason for this is progesterone. Okay, so now again the... Uh, even your hip bone or innominate bone is again three bones together, ileum, pubis, and ischium. Okay. So remember that. Okay. So this is the whole pelvis anatomy. So if you have to identify, you will have to say this is the sacrum. Okay. This is the caustics, the tip of the sacrum. Okay. And then these are the two innominate bones, which are again made up of ileum here. Can you see this is the ileum? This is the ischium. Remember the ischial tuberosity. Okay. So ischium, the sitting bones, what we call, and this is the pubis. Okay, so there are the three bones in one bone actually, but they are nicely joined. There are no joints between these bones. Please remember, not like these bones, sacrum, you know, um, what is this, coccyx and uh, two innominate bones. They have joints in between them which are actually open. But these three parts of the hip bone, there are no joints. They are actually a single bone, different parts of a single bone, that's all. Okay, so that's about the anatomy of the pelvis uh, when we look at the structure. Now, there is something called as axis of birth canal. All of you may be aware of it. It's basically uh, otherwise called as curve of caries. The anatomical axis is called as curve of caries. But what's important for us is the course taken by the fetus when it moves, actually moves down the pelvis is called as obstetric axis. Okay. Initially, till the level of ischial spine, it goes downwards and backwards. Okay. And then it will go downwards and frontwards from the ischial spine onwards. That is the exact curve of caries. Okay. Now, again, your pelvis is uh, uh, again classified as true pelvis and false pelvis. Okay. So it's anatomically divided as true pelvis and false pelvis. Among these two, obviously, what's important for us is one which is smaller because the baby has to go through it. We'll, we'll break our head about the smaller one, not about the larger part of the pelvis. The false pelvis uh, doesn't really have much significance. The only function, what will be the only function of false pelvis, obstetric significance of false pelvis? And to support the gravid uterus. That's, okay. The only function it does is to support the gravid uterus. That's it. Okay. What is important for us is the, the true pelvis which, which lies below the pelvic brim. Okay. So the first uh, so the first question I told you, they can ask you to show the different parts of the pelvis. That is number one question in pelvis. Number two question most commonly asked for undergraduates will be outline the pelvic brim. Okay. That's very important question for you. So outline the pelvic brim. Always start from the front. So it is upper border of pubic symphysis, okay, pubic crest, and then the pubic tubercle, which is there just next to the pubic uh, crest, okay. So this is the pubic symphysis, okay. Is it visible, Priya? Okay. This yes. is a uh, pubic, um, what is that, crest, okay, pubic tubercle, you can see one proper tubercle here, okay, and then we have pectineal line. Okay, and then we have ilopubic eminence on the inlet. There is a small bump here on the pectineal line. See, from pubic tubercle till here, it is completely ilopectineal line. From here till the joint is ilopectineal line. So, two portions. One of the portions is the one on the pubis part of the pelvis, hip bone, and the other one is on the um, ilopectineal pubis and ileal part of the hip bone. Okay, this is an ileum. 
okay so either pectinal line is completely from the what is this part the pubic tubercle to the sacroiliac joint okay so in between this we'll have this ileopubic eminence you can again see a prominence here can you see this eminence here okay that is a ileopubic eminence okay yes, and this is the sacroiliac joint here joint is visible yes ma'am sacrum and this is the ileum so sacroiliac joint okay and then we have the ala of sacrum okay the wing of the sacrum like this and then the sacral promontory okay this is one half of the brim if they ask you to show don't start from here and go only till here you have to start again come back to that particular point brim is a complete circle okay so start from here so we'll do again upper border of pubic symphysis symphysis is a joint so this is only from here midpoint okay and then we have pubic crest okay and pubic tubercle okay the pectineal line pectineal line is the pubic bones line actually the part of the pubic bone so pectineal line ileopubic eminence okay then the ileal part of the ileopectineal line the ileum bones contribution then the sacroiliac joint then the anterior border of ala of sacrum okay the sacrum uh, the wing ala is basically kind of wing so this is the sacro ala of sacrum then the sacral promontory again go ala of sacrum sacroiliac joint ileal part of the ileopectineal line ileopubic eminence okay and then pubic part of the ileopectineal line pubic tubercle pubic crest pubic symphysis so finish the whole thing this is again a very commonly asked question for you in exam this is how you delineate a brim okay so uh, this is very actually this is the simplest question they can ask you in brim then they'll go for different diameters of the pelvic inlet see for the labor to start head has to enter the pelvis right and what do you call that process when the maximum diameter of the fetal head crosses the brim engagement engagement okay so everything occurs at this particular level only when it is able to negotiate this part then the rest of the pelvis becomes important for us right so there are three diameters very easy to remember no need to break your head anterior posterior oblique and transverse uh, what is the transverse diameter okay so how do you uh, remember so just remember as 11 12 13 no, no need to worry about too much about this point 8 and point 7 and point 5 and all at least remember 11 12 13 the anterior posterior is the smallest next is oblique the transverse is the widest so it's almost like a transversely oval kind of inlet okay so that is that is what is uh, diameters of the brim but again there are a lot of uh, other complications it's not that simple because how do you uh, know which anterior posterior diameter is important if you just look at the brim the way we delineated the brim okay uh, what's important is the upper border of pubic symphysis to sacral promontory should be the anatomical inlet okay anatomical anterior posterior diameter okay but uh, that is not the one baby has to negotiate to be frank right it has to negotiate the opposite conjugate which is from the tip of sacral promontory to the most prominent point on the posterior surface of pubic symphysis okay that is what the baby has to negotiate so that is that is why it is called as opposite conjugate even though brim is upper border of pubic symphysis the diameter which we are going to take for the brim is this particular okay then we have diagonal conjugate the, the only importance of diagonal conjugate is what is the importance of diagonal conjugate then ma'am that you can we can clinically assess Very the good. diagonal right. conjugate that is the only diameter which we can actually access clinically assess clinically so not access access and assess clinically we obviously we cannot reach the upper border pubic symphysis or most prominent point and all this stuff basically we can only assess the diagonal conjugate and then we have a way of deducing the opposite conjugate by subtracting 1.5 cm from the diagonal conjugate that is how we uh, know what is opposite conjugate okay there that is about the anterior posterior di uh, diameters uh, the of the inlet okay then we have oblique one thing you have to know about the oblique is they start from sacroiliac joint if they ask you to show left oblique okay never start from the left side of the ileopectineal line okay so always this is the left of the ileopectineal line here okay don't start from the left of this start from left sacroiliac joint and go to the opposite ileopectineal ileopubic eminence okay so just remember the oblique diameter start from the sacroiliac joint if i say left oblique diameter it has to start from the left sacroiliac joint if i say right um, oblique diameter it start from the right sacroiliac joint and it will go to the opposite ileopubic eminence that's all okay please make sure that you understand what is ileopubic eminence this part 
this protuberance what you see here is the aliphatic eminence okay yes ma'am so from from sacroiliac joint to opposite aliphatic eminence okay this will be the right oblique and this will be the left oblique theek okay? hai then we have the transverse it's the largest diameter and on the pelvic brim whichever is the largest diameter is the transverse diameter it's very simple okay from from the farthest point on the brim on the lateral in this particular the orientation is a transverse diameter then there is another concept called as posterior sagittal diameter okay they are going to be there in every uh, inlet mid pelvis and outlet everywhere okay so what is posterior sagittal diameter is you have an anterior posterior diameter okay from here to here or whatever it is it is there okay that is the posterior part of the diameter where the transverse diameter cuts it okay so basically it extends from the point of intersection of obstetric conjugate and the transverse diameter of uh, diameter not bit pelvis let it go at brim okay transverse diameter middle of the sacral promontory okay mm. so this is your anterior posterior diameter okay this is a transverse diameter so both of them intersect right the posterior part of the anterior posterior diameter is what is posterior diameter this is important especially in the mid pelvis more than the brim it's more important in the mid pelvis this is typically very uh, less in case of android pelvis that's where it becomes important for us okay because of a flat sacrum the sacral curvature is very poor over there we'll have a very compromised posterior sagittal diameter psd or posterior sagittal diameter okay that's about the brim is it clear about the brim the different diameters okay yes now let's go to mid pelvis mid pelvis is the next important thing because that is where the plane of least pelvic dimensions come okay so basically plane of least pelvic dimension is um, what what exactly happens at that particular uh, plane is it is the plane where the internal rotation occurs okay and the engagement uh, occurs in the leading part of the fetal skull comes to that level okay and then the internal rotation most important internal rotation this is the level of ischial spines basically again in exam they can ask you what all happens at the level of ischial spine okay we assess station of the presenting part using ischial spine the internal rotation occurs at ischial spine pudendal block is given keeping ischial spine as a landmark so these some few things you prepare the answer and keep like this because suddenly it will become difficult to tell remember and uh, compile your answer and organize answer and tell in exam so few questions like this you have to have the answers ready okay so okay. basically the mid, uh, the plane of least pelvic dimensions is bound by fourth and fifth sacral vertebra okay the white line the ischial spine sacrospinous ligament and pubic symphysis basically it's a plane you know from the level of ischial spines go to the junction of fourth and sixth sacral vertebra okay it will it will overlie the obturator foramen actually like the sacrospinous ligament will be there it will go along the sacrospinous ligament okay and then it will come anteriorly like this is, this is basically the narrowest part of the passage with the passenger has to go through okay that's why it's called as plane of least pelvic dimensions now again we have some diameters here also the anterior posterior diameter it extends from junction of fourth and fifth sacral vertebra s4 and s5 to lower border pubic symphysis okay and the transverse diameter is between the two ischial spines interostial spine is diameter okay so remember 11.5 10.5 and psd is 6 cm that is again wherever the interostial spine diameter cuts the anterior posterior diameter the intersection of the anterior posterior and the transverse the posterior part is what is posterior sagittal diameter of the mid pelvis okay so this is a plane of uh, least pelvic dimensions we have one more between the s2 s3 and midpoint of pubic symphysis called as plane of great pelvic dimensions this is of no obstetric importance actually we will comfortably go through that particular level what's important for us is the plane of least pelvic dimensions at the level of ischial spines here okay and anterior posteriorly it is lower border pubic symphysis to junction of s4 and s5 okay uh, then we have pelvic outlet okay outlet again is made of two triangles with a common base the base the the line which is a common for both of them is a line drawn between the two ischial tuberosities you uh, it's very difficult to show in this or let me remove this here. okay see this is the two ischial tuberosities you have one line here like this okay this is the anterior triangle and this is the posterior triangle the triangle which joins the coccyx okay and the ischial tuberosity like this this is how the what do you say the two triangles come here okay so that is that is the outlet actually okay now uh, posterior triangle uh, anterior triangle the apex is the pubic ramen here you can see the subpubic angle 
and the posterior triangle, the apex is sacrococcygeal junction. Okay. Then diameter is again here, anterior posterior is 12 centimeter, extends from the lower margin of pubic symphysis to sacrococcygeal junction from here to here. Okay, that is around 12 centimeters. And transverse diameter is 10.5. Please remember in the inlet, it is transversely oval. In the outlet, it is anterior posteriorly oval. That is how the whole uh, the uh, birth axis changes. Okay. Then we have transverse diameter 10.5 and the PSD here will be nine cent uh, 7 centimeters. Okay. You don't need to memorize, at least understand what is posterior diameter. See the outlet, uh, one more entity you should know here, I'll tell you. This is an image, you can see this. Okay. This is how the common base and anterior triangle and posterior triangle is schematically shown. Okay. Mm, yeah, subcubic angle. Here we'll understand some concept basically. It's formed by the meeting of two uh, descending pubic ramen. You can see this. Okay. This is a subcubic angle. Okay. Uh, it, in females, it measures around 90 degrees, 85 to 90 degrees. So it's, it's almost like right angle to obtuse angle. If the angle is less, then transverse diameter of the outlet will also be less. If this is narrower like this, and even this is going to come closer, and the TDO is going to be narrower. Okay. Transverse diameter of outlet, the interstitial tuberosity diameter is going to be less. That is an understood thing. Okay, if these ramae are together. But what's important is there is some entity called as waste space of Morris. Okay, can you see this image here? Okay, have a you know you keep a skull like this over here. You can see you can see how much space is there between the. This is a very good subcubic angle. Okay, this is an artificial pelvis, so obviously it will be made appropriately. Okay, so you can see there is hardly any waste space between the subcubic angle and the fetal skull, okay. But if this becomes narrow, okay, then what happens? Let's keep it like this or uh, like this. Can you make out the difference now? See how much space is wasted over there. Yes, ma'am. Okay? So a larger diameter or a narrower space will lead to significant wastage of space available for us in the anterior posterior diameter, okay. So what happens there is, um, the baby will preferentially use the posterior triangle to deliver rather than anterior. Okay. So when it uses the posterior triangle, the chances of perineal trauma is going to be higher. Okay. Whenever there is too much of waste space of Morris, the subcubic ramae is narrow and you know that there is not much space over there and for the head to go almost to this thing, there's going to be a lot of spaces getting wasted. You a liberal episode. That is what is clinical application for us in this. If it is not contracted pelvis, it's going to deliver, but it's going to use the posterior triangle preferentially than the anterior because of excess waste space of Morris. You have to remember to give a liberal episode. That's it. Okay. That's about the subcubic angle. Now, what else? Uh -huh. Last thing about the pelvis will be the classification of the pelvis, which was initially by Calvell and Molly. It's still being, uh, you know, um, propagated nicely by them, by whatever classification they have started. See, it's very easy for me to tell that, you know, uh, gynecoid is 50%, anthropoid is 25%, android is 20 platypelod is 5 But please remember, in practice, it is rarely a pure type of pelvis. We'll always have combination of pelvis. The anterior portion is like gynecoid, the posterior portion is like anthropoid. Like that, we can have combination also. Whichever is predominant, we will go according to that and call them as gynecoid, anthropoid, android, and pedicoid. So there are different ways, you know, different ways of explaining what exactly are these pelvises. Okay. Basically, gynecoid pelvis, the inlet is oval transversely. We already discussed this. Okay. Inlet, inlet is oval transversely. And the side walls are straight, spines are not prominent, and at the outlet, pubic arch is wide. Okay. Basically, this is an ideal feminine pelvis. Okay. Um, then we have android pelvis, which is a masculine pelvis. Okay, it is not fit for childbearing, actually. Okay, then we have an anthropoid pelvis, which is actually a monkey kind of pelvis, a long, which is compressed transversely kind of pelvis. Okay, and then we have a flat pelvis, which is extremely rare. Okay, and a very short anteroposterior diameter, but a very wide transverse diameter is typical in flat pelvis. Okay, which is not that common. Hardly in this diagram, you can see here, we hardly have 5% um, as flat pelvis. Okay, majority of the cases will have gynecoid pelvis, almost half of them. Then android and anthropoid are almost equal. Okay, and then platypelod is very, very less. Okay, so now. Um, 
this is about your listing now let's go to the mechanism of labor okay so is it clear about the pelvis do you have any doubts in pelvis fine shall we move to the mechanism of labor yes so you'll be yes. able to answer these questions about the pelvis now okay um let's stop sharing uh why the stop share you just stop the sharing now bachcha i'll share again when you go to the mechanism uh, i'll stop uh, it stop now yeah yeah, yeah fine so this is how actually how do you hold the pelvis we have a mounted specimen here you would have seen okay in exam they will ask you what is the orientation of pelvis okay yeah this is how it is mounted pelvis is very easy otherwise you go to a wall and put like this on the wall where your uh, pubic tubercle and the anterior superior allies spine should be at the same plane that is how this this pelvis is mounted actually okay this is the anatomical position of the pelvis okay then show the different parts of the pelvis as we already explained okay and uh, the pelvic delineation of the pelvic brim is the next question okay very very commonly asked then um, the ischial spines they last you to identify sacrosciatic notch and all this stuff one important thing is they ask you how do you do a clinical pelvic assessment how do you measure the diagonal conjugate okay so please be very uh, careful use these two fingers okay and go above like this and try to touch the sacral promontory okay here there is no soft tissue resistance nothing so you'll be able to touch the sacral promontory it doesn't mean that this pelvis is inadequate or whatever but that is how you measure the diagonal conjugate it's a difficult with a mounted pelvis actually my fingers are getting twisted but it's very easy when you have a pelvis in your hand to go and easily touch the sacral promontory okay so you should know where exactly the pelvis the you know Uh, on your arc, whatever this what you call the web of the web between the thumb and index finger, where exactly it cuts, and then you tell that is the diagonal conjugate. So what will be the opposite conjugate? Subtract one point five centimeters from the diagonal conjugate. Yes. Okay, so that is how we do. That's clinical assessment. This is the first thing we do. Okay, and then we'll see this curvature of the sacrum, whether sacrum is well curved or it is flat or whatever. Just, uh, then come to the lowermost part of the sacrum that is coccyx. Okay, see how the coccyx is oriented. Is it jutting forwards or it is, you know, just mobile and it is fine? They comment about the coccyx. Then come to the lateral part of the pelvis. Okay, look at how the orientation of the side walls is. Are the side walls convergent? Okay, or straight or parallel or whatever. Okay, what's important should not be convergent. And comment about the ischial spine. This is the ischial spine. Can you see here? Really yes. This is the ischial spine. You can see now. Okay. So see whether you are able to touch both the ischial spines at the same time. Please remember, this is how we hold the fingers. Moment you do like this, you can easily extend it. Can you see the distance between my two fingers now? You can easily extend, but you have to have it like this. Dorsal position. You have to have it like this. Then only your finger distance between the two finger tips is going to be less than eight centimeters. Okay. So go like this and try to touch both the ischial spines at the same time. If you are able to touch them in the dorsal same orientation, then it is inadequate pelvis. It's less than eight centimeters. Okay. If you are not able to touch them, then it is easy. One more thing over here is, see, if I have even if it is dorsal orientation like this, if I have something coming, my fingers can extend easily. Can you see? See, this is a diameter for me. Maximum I can stretch. Okay. But there is head coming down. Then you can easily stretch it further, and I can easily touch both the ischial spines. So these are the things. Never turn your hand like this. Okay, it has to be together. Don't ever do, try to do this again. You'll be able to extend both the touch both the ischial spines, and never try to force your this thing with some head or something. So when the head is come down below the spine, it's very difficult to assess the ischial spines because head will keep separating your two fingers. You will say it's inadequate. Okay, so that's how it is. Um, That is the next thing: ischial spine, side walls, and we have sacrosciatic notch. Can you see this notch here? This one, yeah, between the uh, ischial spine and the sacrum. This is where the your sacrosciatic ligament is going to be. This notch. We have to put at least this should accommodate at least two fingers like this. Can you see? This is easily accommodating two fingers. If this is accommodating less than two fingers, it's an indicator that the posterior sagittal diameter is lesser. This is the clinically how we assess the posterior sagittal diameter. Is it clear? Okay. And then once we finish all these things, then only we will come out and assess the subcubic angle. Subcubic angle. There is there are different ways of assessing. You can do like this or you can do like this. Okay. Whatever. But generally we just feel like this. And if we feel that it is not to the rama, cubic rama is not very close together, we take it as adequate. Okay. And then the last thing is 
make a knuckle and go and feel between the two tuberosities. Okay, that is called as transverse diameter of outlet. We say accommodates four knuckles. Again, you should know. So, what all you should know now? You should know the distance between the tip of your middle finger to the arch wherever it touches. That measurement you should know. You should know what is the measurement between your tip of index and middle finger in the dorsal uh, orientation. And you should know what is the measurement between the four knuckles. Okay, only then you'll be able to tell in centimeters exactly how it goes. Okay, that is a clinical pelvic assessment. That much you should be able to tell in exam. They'll ask you, how do you measure diagonal conjugate? They're very commonly asked questions. Identify sacrosarotic notch. Identify the ischial spine. Okay, ischial tuberosity. How do you measure the TDO? Again, very easy. Just make knuckle and go and put between the two ischial tuberosities. Okay. So, that's about your uh, pelvis and the skull separately. Now, we'll use both of them and try to show you the, what do you say, mm, the mechanism of labor. So, mechanism of labor, commonly they'll ask you uh, demonstrate in case of uh, uh, left occipital transverse. Okay, that's the most common way the head enters the pelvis. So, we'll go in the same way. Okay, so we have, take the skull. I told you how to hold the skull. Okay, so you have the foramen magnum. Okay, this is the foramen magnum. It should be open. If it's an actual skull, it will be open. This is a duplicate skull, so it is not open. Okay, and then two fingers in the maximum process. Okay, so now this is the skull. Okay, and you it is it is already mounted, so I'm holding it properly. This it's the way it is supposed to be held. Okay, and this is the left side. This is the right side. Okay, so now I want to show you left occipital transverse. Okay, so hold the skull facing downwards. Please remember never hold the skull like this when you're showing the mechanism of labor. Always upside down. Okay, and go in like this. Can you see? So, what you are seeing here is occiput is in the left quadrant. So, the position is left occiput or transverse. Is it clear? Okay. So, this is how the head enters. A well-flexed head you should always tilt the occiput downwards. Can you see this? This is a well-flexed head. Okay. And it is entering in the tra transverse diameter of the inlet. So, if it is a well-flexed head, what will be the anteroposterior diameter here? Suboxibuto bregmatic, which is 9.5 centimeter. 9.5 centimeter easily engages in 13 centimeter of transverse That's diameter of the inlet. Basically, baby wants to travel comfortably. Okay. So that is how the engagement occurs. Okay. First of all, the head engages in this particular thing. Okay. So whenever they ask you the mechanism of labor in left occiput or transverse, okay. So you should say the occiput is the denominator. Okay. It is lying in the left quadrant. In left occipital transverse, the fetal diameter which will come into play here is the suboxpital pragmatic, if it, assuming it's a well flexed head, and the maternal uh, pelvis diameter, which is the engaging diameter, is the transverse diameter of the inlet, which is 13 centimeters. So you have to start the answer like this and then go on. Then you say with good uterine contractions and descent throughout. Okay, in any mechanism of labor, tell off these two in the beginning so that you know you need not comment about it throughout. Okay, first thing which occurs is engagement. Okay, good uterine contractions, descent, the BPD crosses the brain. Okay, actually, BPD is in the anteroposterior diameter. Please remember. Okay, BPD yes, 9.5 is engaging in 11 centimeter of the anteroposterior diameter, and anteroposterior diameter of the head is suboxbuto pragmatic that is engaging in the Transverse diameter, 13 centimeter. Okay, totally both of them are compatible here. Okay, so engagement occurs. Okay, once engagement occurs with further descent, okay, what happens? The head touches the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor is made up of? Levator and muscle. Levator and muscle. Okay, levator and muscle has a very important, uh, what do you say? Um, I don't know what to say. A property of the muscle is whatever touches the levator and muscle will get pushed anteriorly by 45 degree. Okay, the muscle is like this. If I'm touching this, okay, the fibers will act in such a way that I get pushed anteriorly by 45 degree. Okay, that is how both the, and remember there are two levator and muscles. It's very important to understand this concept. We have a left levator and we have a right levator. Okay, so we have one, one like this and another levator and like this basically. Two of them will be there in orienting the fibers are oriented like that, such that if the occiput touches the left levator only, it will get pushed anteriorly by 45 degree. Okay. I'll explain to you using ROP if we have time. We still have time, right? It's seven o'clock. Okay. So now mechanism of labor, just remember. So you entered like this in LOT. Okay. Engagement occurred. 
then you went to the level of ischial spines please remember levator ana are at the level of ischial spines theek okay? hai so once the head goes to the level of ischial spines and touches the see what is the denominator in well flexed head vertex denominator vertex is presentation occiput occiput okay so occiput is down here please remember look at the way i'm holding the skull i'm showing oh. as if the occiput is the lower most part right so in lot what happens is it will go like this and it will touch the left half of the levator ana not the right one the left levator ana it touches okay and when the head when the contraction occurs head descends at that point it will go and touch the left levator ana that will get pushed anteriorly to 45 degree so lot becomes loa okay left occipital anterior okay now what you have to remember over it a little bit imagination because i don't have the dummy here see when the head is entering in the anterior posterior diameter like this okay in the transverse in lot position where are the shoulders anterior posterior diameter anterior posterior shoulders will be in the anterior posterior diameter like this remember like this okay exactly perpendicular to the head okay so when the head moves 45 degree like this kunj move your head to 45 degree like this you can move comfortably to 45 degree right if you have to move further another 45 degree what will happen just show me move further your shoulder also moves okay so have okay. this concept clear in your mind okay so neck can easily withstand the torque of 45 degree so okay so first lot shoulders are in anterior posterior okay it turns anterior shoulders remain in anterior posterior holding the torque of 45 degree in the neck okay the next contraction the occiput again touches the left levator ana and gets pushed further by 45 degree at that time what should happen see this the shoulders have to turn because they cannot withstand the torque of more than 45 degree so shoulders came in which oblique now along the left oblique left oblique left oblique, left oblique. See, left oblique. near the left sacroiliac joint okay so now head is i mean the occiput is just below the pubic symphysis okay and shoulders are in left oblique remember that much okay so now what happens once occiput hinges below the left i mean pubic symphysis crowning occurs and then head delivers by extension okay can you see this head delivers by extension like this theek okay? hai okay shoulders are still in left oblique diameter remember that okay so now once you are free would you like to hold any torque in the neck you want so as soon as the head is free outside the pelvis the whatever torque was held will get corrected okay that is called as restitution theek hai it was like this the torque this is the uh, shoulders in the left oblique diameter that it was like this and it will go back like this towards the left side because there was a torque of 45 degree okay so now what happens how do, what's the next step after restitution what's the next step in the rotation paper, external rotation external rotation. rotation so how does the external rotation occur i don't know okay. how the restitution occurs restitution is basically untwisting of the neck that's all okay it was like this so it just goes back to lie comfortably with the neck straight now okay now what happens is the shoulders the mechanical labor starts the head is outside right so the shoulder is in left oblique diameter please always remember the anterior shoulder is at a lower level than posterior shoulder okay so the anterior fore shoulder touches the right levator ana can you imagine okay can you see here okay this is the right levator ana on the right side okay that gets pushed by 45 degree anterior okay because the head is lying free outside it need not hold any torque that also moves 45 degree which is sensed by us as external rotation of 45 degree more towards the way it entered the pelvis it will go back to the same side see and it entered the pelvis in lot like this okay look at the shoulders now okay it turned 45 degree shoulders stayed in anterior posterior it turned 90 degree shoulders twisted to left oblique okay then it delivered once it delivered the torque was released and it it went back towards left side like this it loa kind of position and the shoulders started going undergoing the cardinal movements and shoulder the anterior shoulder will touch the left level, right levator ana and gets pushed like this so the same movement will get transferred to the head as further 45 degree external rotation is it clear okay yes, that is how exactly the cardinal movements of labor take place okay and then the shoulder will hinge the anterior shoulder will hinge below pubic symphysis and the posterior shoulder will deliver 
by lateral flexion. The rest of the body is delivered by lateral flexion of the spine. Okay, so that is the cardinal movements which take place in uh, vertex presentation in LOT position. So in LOT position, the internal rotation is going to be 90 degree. Okay, and in LOA it is 45 degree. Now, to understand the concept of your uh, uh, internal rotation mode, let's go to ROP. Okay, uh, is it clear? I'll, I'll just take another five minutes, that's all. Done. But we can't go more than one hour for a YOO station now. Okay, so uh, this part is clear to you people. So when yeah. I ask you yes. first, identify what is the denominator, what is the presentation, all those things. If somebody tells you, show me the mechanism of labor in LOT position. That's how they're supposed to ask the questions or LOA position. Okay, so always say how the in LOT, assuming it is a well flexed head, the anteroposterior diameter is suboxbit of pragmatic, okay, which will engage in transverse diameter of the inlet. Okay, once engagement occurs with con uh, uh, contra with good contractions and descent throughout, the further descent occurs and the occiput will touch the left levator RNA. With each contraction, there, there happens a forward movement of or internal rotation of 45 degree. Okay, and then totally 90 degree of internal rotation occurs in LOT. It, the occiput hitches under the pubic symphysis and delivers. Once it delivers, restitution occurs to relieve the torque held in the neck. Okay, and uh, once restitution occurs, the shoulders will be undergoing the mechanism of labor and external rotation of the head occurs, which corresponds to internal rotation of the shoulders. That's how we'll say. Okay, restitution corresponds to uh, basically uh, untorquing of the neck and external rotation of the head corresponds to internal rotation of the shoulders. Is it clear? Okay, and then the shoulders and the rest of the body deliver by lateral flexion of the body, spine. Okay. That's about the mechanism of labor in vertex presentation, how, how we are supposed to answer in Viva. Okay, so now let's, uh, um, I'll be sharing my screen again. This is the, this is the whole thing. Can you see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. So we have engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, crowning, extension, restitution, external rotation, and lateral flexion. The same moments what we discussed till now. Now, mm. this is the ROP position. Can you see this? Okay. So, in right occipital posterior position, the mechanism of labor is really interesting actually. Um, there are different outcomes depending on what kind of pelvis we have, what is the degree of flexion and all those things. Okay. In case of the most favorable will be a good gynecoid pelvis, average size fetus, good uterine contractions and increasing flexion of the head. Okay. This will make it favorable and it will turn a long anterior rotation. Okay, 135 degree and it will be delivered as occipital anterior, the way we explained till now. Okay, let's look at that one first. Okay, so now how do you hold the head? Always when you're showing right occipital posterior, instead of holding like this, hold it like this. Okay, and enter the pelvis like this. The occiput should be in the posterior quadrant on the right side. Okay, this is how we enter. And please remember that in ROP, deflection is a rule. Okay. The diameter is going to be either suboccipital frontal or occipital frontal, depending on the degree of deflection. Okay, so you remember that anteroposterior diameter in vertex was suboccipital pragmatic, nine point five centimeter. But here it's going to be ten point five or even twelve point five. Okay, but remember that your oblique diameter is only twelve centimeter. Right? In ROP, the engagement has to occur in the which oblique? Right oblique. Right oblique. Okay. So, right oblique diameter is 12 centimeter and your diameter is 11.5 centimeter. So, it's not going to be as comfortable as in vertex presentation. Please remember. Okay. That is why the engagement is delayed. Okay. And if it is de properly deflexed head and presenting occipital frontal, engagement will never occur, occur only because 12.5 has to engage in 12 centimeter. Not possible. It's going to be very tight fitting. Okay. So, some flexion has to occur. Okay, and you should go to suboxpital frontal only then the engagement happens. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, let me hold this. Yeah. This is the pelvis. Okay. This is the this is how we hold the ROP. This is how we hold the ROP. Okay. And then after that, again the same thing. If, if the flexion further increases, occipital touch the right levator. Right? Occiput is the denominator. If the flexion increases, it will touch the right levator. And with each contraction, it will keep moving 45 degree. 
uh, up to a rotation of almost 135 degree or 3 eighths of a circle. Is it clear? Okay, the, the, it can, you can tell either in degrees or you can tell in eighth of circle also. Instead of 90 degree, you can say two eighths of a circle. Instead of 45 degree, you can say one eighth of a circle, whatever. Okay, but here in ROP, in favorable circumstances, it is three eighths of a circle or 135 degree. Okay, then you uh, now, now imagine the shoulders. Okay, when the head is engaging in ROP, where are the shoulders? The left oblique. Left oblique. Left oblique. Okay. When head becomes ROT, shoulders continue to be in left oblique. Agreed? Because 45 degree can easily be with, with student. Then when head becomes ROA, shoulders come in anterior posterior diameter. Okay? And when the head becomes direct occipital anterior, okay, 135 degree integration, then shoulders will be in right oblique diameter. Okay. okay? You're able to understand this much? Okay? Then what happens? Head will deliver. Okay, 45 degree torque is released and head will go back to ROA. Then the anterior shoulder will touch the left levator because it's in right oblique diameter. I told you anterior shoulder is lower than the posterior shoulder. Okay, and that will get pushed anterior by 45 degrees. So head will further move outside as external rotation towards more towards the right thigh, going back to ROT push. Okay, so that is how the whole mechanical river happens in favorable circumstances. Now, we have another entity called as deep transverse arrest. All of you would have heard it. Deep transverse arrest is arrest of labor in second stage of labor at the level of ischial spines. Okay. That is typically seen in android pelvis. In android, what happens? Head enters. Okay. Engagement occurs. It goes up to the ischial spines. The problem is at the level of ischial spines. So, up to the ischial spines, it will go there. Okay. And it will touch the right levator array and goes 45 degree anteriorly. So there is going to be only one eighth of a circle or forty five degree anti rotation here, and it goes into ROT position now. Okay, but the no further movement is possible because of converging side walls. Okay, there is basically a mechanical factor there which is which doesn't let the head to go further any any further rotation, so it gets stuck over there as deep transverse arrest at the level of ischial spines. That that happens more commonly in android pelvis. Okay. Another entity is anthropoid pelvis, okay, where the deflection persists. Further flexion does not occur at all, okay. So, if the deflection is like this, head is like this, you can see that both occiput and sinciput are touching both the halves of levator at a simultaneously. So, what happens? Neither of them can move forward. It will get cancelled. The movements of the right will cancel the left and movement of the left will cancel the right. Same thing will happen and the head will stay in ROP as persistent occipital posterior that is zero degree rotation okay if there is no mechanical problem head can descend in the same way up to plus two station and it becomes fit for instrumentation we can apply, apply a vacuum extraction and deliver the baby or we can use keyland forceps a rotational forceps okay only if it is come down to plus two station in deep transverse arrest i told you it stops at the level of spines okay so there is no instrumentation at that particular level because it's a mechanical factor which is not letting it come down over there. There is no point going and applying instrument. It will be causing more morbidity for the mother and for the fetus also. Okay. So, the DTA, if it is the level of spines, it has to be severe in section. Okay. But here, persistent occipital posterior, if there is no mechanical problem, it will descend down to plus two. But the position is going to be occipital posterior only. It won't have any internal rotation. Because it is deflexed. Okay. And presenting a larger diameter. So, you will have to use vacuum and if you apply the vacuum on the flexion point, flexion point is just in front of the posterior fontanelle. Imagine you apply the vacuum more towards the posterior fontanelle, when you pull it, head will go into flexion. You will be flexing the head also and pulling the head down also. Okay. So that is how we apply the vacuum and deliver the head in versus the If it is come down to plus two, please remember, no instrument if it is not come down to plus two. Okay. Then another entity is where the deflection is profound. Okay, so this is how it was, right? Can you see the skull now? This is how the head was. In well flexed head, the occiput was down like this. Now, this is a deflexed head where both sinciput and occiput are touching simultaneously. Now, let's assume it's like this. Not exactly brow. Brow is this. Okay, this is your uh, occiput of frontal diameter when it comes into play, you know, 12.5 centimeter, that particular diameter, where sinciput is lower than occiput. Okay, so now imagine you're in ROP. Okay. In a deflexed head, your sinciput is lower than occiput. 
So sense of foot will touch the left levator arm. Okay, and that will get pushed and relieve a 45 degree. So automatically your denominator, that is occiput, is going minus 45 degree. Okay, what what will happen if this happens? What's the outcome here? How will be delivered? Face will come out first. What do you call the delivery? Breach. Face to pubis delivery. Okay. It's called as face to pubis. Baby will be like this. It will, it will deliver like this. You can see the face of the baby will be seen to first. Okay. That is face to delivery. The problem with face to delivery is wider occiput will sweep over the perineum. So there is significantly increased risk of perineal trauma. So requires a very liberal episiotomy to avoid complete perineal tears and all this stuff. Okay. That is one uh, possibility when it goes back like that. If it progresses further down, the baby is not very huge and all this stuff, it, it go down, goes down like that and delivers a special delivery. Okay. Either instrument or SVD or whatever. Okay. Both are possible. If there is no disproportion. If there is disproportion, baby is too big or the pelvis is not good low down there, then it will get stuck in the same position. That is, that's called a sacral arrest. Because the occiput is directly next to the sacrum, it is called a sacral arrest. Okay. So there are different outcomes now. The most common is the favorable circumstances where it will turn 135 degree anteriorly, deliver as occiputal anterior. Then in android pelvis, we'll have deep, deep transverse arrest with HH delivered by cesarean section. Okay. In anthropoid pelvis, we can have persistent occiputal posterior. If there is no disproportion, we can apply instrument and deliver. It will turn and flex and turn and really and deliver as occiputal anterior only. Okay. And in case of um, uh, further more pronounced deflection, the sensiput will touch the left levator cranium and gets anteriorly. So the occiput automatically goes minus 45 degree, more towards the sacrum. Here it can deliver as stage tubus delivery or it can deliver as, it, it can get stuck as sacral arrest where to deliver the cesarean section. Okay. This is the mechanism of labor. This, I mean, I just added ROP because I always feel by telling ROP, you'll understand the concept of shoulder movement and interrotation much more easily. Okay. Any doubts? Bachelor, any doubts? Ma'am, uh, when do we check for the pelvic diameters? Um, see, in all primaries, we need to check because we have, they, have, they have not had the test of labor. The best pelvic meter actually is fetal pelvic. So if a baby is able to manipulate an average size baby was delivered previously in a multi, we don't need to bother. But remember one thing, in successive pregnancies, the size of baby is going to become bigger and bigger. Okay. So if you if the mother has delivered a 3 kg baby in the first pregnancy, this time she may have a 3.5 because it's an experienced uterus. It will be capable of uh, you know, nourishing the growing fetus much more capably. So that is, uh, uh, stop the sharing uh, Priya. Uh, not able to okay okay some soft okay. is coming okay fine okay so um, in primaries generally we assess labor for all the patients okay in multis only if the previous baby was very small 2.5 kg delivered now the baby is looking pretty big like 3.5 3.75 then we have to assess okay so pelvic assessment is very commonly done actually some, some people say, just wait in labor and see if she'll deliver. It is the best pelvic meter. Right? Okay. But generally in institutions like ours, where we have a very heavy load of obstetrics, see, do you know how many we deliver by, per month here? Number of deliveries per month in Jukmar, we have reached almost 1800 deliveries per month. So you can imagine the kind of obstetric load we have. Okay. So during pandemic, the numbers have come down significantly because we don't encourage women coming in because we are COVID hospital also. So not many come in, but just before the pandemic, our numbers were almost 1886 kind of thing, like almost reaching 2000 per month. Okay. So in this kind of crowd, we have to be very sure that we don't let women come to us in obstructed labor. Okay, they'll be dependent entirely on us for the uh, obstetric care. So we assess in the OPD itself, the pelvis for all the primaries. Multis, we do not assess. When they come in labor or there is significant change in the baby size, then we assess pelvis. Okay. And in primaries, we have 39 weeks, we assess the pelvis. And if everything is fine, we call them at 41 weeks for if they don't go into labor by themselves for induction of labor. That's what is routinely done in our institute. Okay, in previous LSCS, at 37, 38 only, we'll assess the pelvis and decide whether she's fit for trial, everything we decide, and then we take a call. Because if they're not fit for trial, either by history or by examination, a big baby or a bad pelvis or something like that, or some bad previous history, then we do section at 39 weeks, elective section. 
if they are fit for trial then we allow them for trial of uh, scar and deliver them the feedback okay so pelvic assessment in previous lsc you have to do because she is not actually delivered even though she is a multi in primaries you have to do in multis it depends okay generally in multis we not very particular until unless the baby appears very big theek okay. hai but remember how to do a pelvic assessment what i told you it's very important they last you some points not everything but they last you some points okay any other doubts shall we close the session just doubt on the chat box so chat box do you have anything okay i'll just tell just check i'm not check this uh, clinically do you feel for all these abilash are you there abilash can you ask that question yourself Uh, Abhilash is there or gone? I am not able to understand. Yeah, exactly, he wants. Uh, ma'am, in uh, cl- uh, pelvis assessment, ma'am. Yeah. And where exactly do you feel for the all structures, ma'am? Is it through the vaginal wall or through the lower uterine segment, ma'am? No, no, no. Vaginal. It's a PV per vaginal examination. We put the two fingers inside. See, when I showed you like this, it is through the vagina. Okay. When we do a PV, we assess the cervical status and then we assess the pelvis. okay that is what we do when we do a pv at term for these women okay all these parameters we feel through the vagina not lower uterine segment palpation okay i think somebody is asked how do you make out the uh, position by pv okay again the same thing you you look at the fetal skull okay so this is how the baby is presenting upside down please remember the upside down always okay this is this is how it is so when i'm doing pv if it is occiput or anterior okay i'll be feeling the posterior fontanel more prominently right if you are not able to feel the posterior fontanel prominently you are able to feel the anterior fontanel then it means it's a deflexed head is it clear okay and if you are able to feel one of the parietal bones more prominently than the other then it means it is asynclitic okay the sagittal suture should be in the middle line if it is not in the midline it is tilted to one side you are able to feel one parietal bone more prominently than the other parietal bone then it means it is asynclitism is taken place okay asynclitism can be a way of manipulating the pelvis actually okay maybe you will use that lesser diameter whatever and it will manipulate the pelvis but asynclitism can also be a sign of cpd also like a baby is try to manipulate it's not able to manipulate so it is stuck in asynclitism you have caput you have molding and you have asynclitism it's more of cpd rather than trying to negotiate okay but you have molding molding again is a way of negotiating please remember all of you know what is molding right the heads will uh, the suture lines are not still fully ossified so they can overlap or approximate or whatever okay so molding also is a way of reducing the available diameters and trying to negotiate the brim or rest of the pelvis okay so even asynclitism is one of the ways of negotiating but if it becomes irreversible molding you know both the bones are overlapping you're not able to separate them okay that's great three molding or there is significant asynclitism there is a huge caput all these things will make it you know uh, it, that is head is trying to negotiate it is not able to negotiate so it is showing signs of cpd okay so understood how do we make out the position basically we have to look for sagittal suture anterior fontanel posterior fontanel okay so there is suture whichever diameter it showing you know the position by that okay and the attitude flexion deflexion you will know by relative feel of whether anterior fontanel is feel felt better or posterior fontanel is felt better in a well flexed head i told you the occiput is low down so obviously in pv you will be able to feel the occiput much more easily than the sinciput so that means posterior fontanel is felt easily than the anterior okay what else is there what is the difference between trial of scar and trial of labor okay um, trial of scar is basically in previous lscs patients and uh, trial of labor is a very vague term we call it as brim trial when the brim is borderline contracted and your baby is not very huge you think it may deliver so we allow brim trial okay trial of scar is only in scar uterus any other question just go through uh, priya i think they have answered some questions that's all yeah Kunch, is there anything in YouTube? No, no, nothing on YouTube. Oh, no, no, that's it. That question. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yes. Ma'am. Shall we close the session? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Bye, bye. Thank you very much, bye. ma'am. Thank you. You simplified the concepts. Okay, ma'am. I'll be happy if it's useful for you guys. Yeah. Take care. Bye, bye. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. ma'am.